On reaching Petersburg Pierre did not let anyone know of his arrival, he went nowhere and spent whole days in reading Thomas a Kempis, whose book had been sent him by someone unknown. One thing he continually realized as he read that book. The joy, hitherto unknown to him, of believing in the possibility of attaining perfection, and in the possibility of active brotherly love among men, which Joseph Alexeyevich had revealed to him. A week after his arrival, the young Polish Count, Wilarski, whom Pierre had known slightly in Petersburg society, came into his room one evening in the official and ceremonious manner in which Dolokhov's second had called on him and, having closed the door behind him and satisfied himself that there was nobody else in the room, addressed Pierre. I have come to you with a message and an offer, Count, he said without sitting down. A person of very high standing in our brotherhood has made application for you to be received into our order before the usual term and has proposed to me to be your sponsor. I consider it a sacred duty to fulfill that person's wishes. Do. You wish to enter the Brotherhood of Freemasons under my sponsorship. Single quote. The cold, austere tone of this man, whom he had almost always before met at balls, amiably smiling in the society of the most brilliant women, surprised Pierre. Yes, I do wish it, said he. Wilarski bowed his head. One more question, Count, he said, which beg you to answer in all sincerity not as a future mason but as an honest man. Have you renounced your former convictions? Do you believe in God? Single quote. Pierre considered. Yes, yes, I believe in God, he said. In that case, began Wilarski, but Pierre interrupted him. Yes, I do believe in God, he repeated. In that case we can go, said Wilarski. My carriage is at your service. Single quote. Wilarski was silent throughout the drive. To Pierre's inquiries as to what he must do and how he should answer, Wilarski only replied that brothers more worthy than he would test him and that Pierre had only to tell the truth. Having entered the courtyard of a large house where the lodge had its headquarters, and having ascended a dark staircase, they entered a small well-lit anteroom where they took off their cloaks without the aid of a servant. From there they passed into another room. A man in strange attire appeared at the door. Wilarski, stepping toward him, said something to him in French in an undertone and then went up to a small wardrobe in which Pierre noticed garments such as he had never seen before. Having taken a kerchief from the cupboard, Wilarski bound Pierre's eyes with it and tied it in a knot behind, catching some hairs painfully in the knot. Then he drew his face down, kissed him, and taking him by the hand led him forward. The hairs tied in the knot hurt Pierre and there were lines of pain on his face and a shamefaced smile. His huge figure, with arms hanging down and with a puckered, though smiling face, moved after Wilarski with uncertain, timid steps. Having led him about ten paces, Wilarski stopped. Whatever happens to you, he said, you must bear it. All manfully if you have firmly resolved to join our brotherhood. Single quote opening parenthesis. Pierre nodded affirmatively. Closing parenthesis. When you hear a knock at the door, you will uncover your eyes. Added Wilarski. I wish you courage and success, and, pressing Pierre's hand, he went out. Left alone, Pierre went on smiling in the same way. Once or twice he shrugged his and raised his hand to the kerchief, as if wishing to take it off, but let it drop again. The five minutes spent with his eyes bandaged seemed to him an hour. His arms felt numb, his legs almost gave way, it seemed to him that he was tired out. He experienced a variety of most complex sensations. He felt afraid of what would happen to him and still more afraid of showing his fear. He felt curious to know what was going to happen and what would be revealed to him. But most of all, 
He felt joyful that the moment had come when he would at last start on that path of regeneration and on the actively virtuous life of which he had been dreaming since he met Joseph Alexeyevich. Loud knocks were heard at the door. Pierre took the bandage off his eyes and glanced around him. The room was in black darkness, only a small lamp was burning inside something white. Pierre went nearer and saw that the lamp stood on a black table on which lay an open book. The book was the gospel, and the white thing with the lamp inside was a human skull with its cavities and teeth. After reading the first words of the gospel, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, Pierre went round the table and saw a large open box filled with something. It was a coffin with bones inside. He was not at all surprised by what he saw. Hoping to enter on an entirely new life quite unlike the old one, he expected everything to be unusual, even more unusual than what he was seeing. A skull, a coffin, the gospel it seemed to him that he had expected all this and even more. Trying to stimulate his emotions he looked around. God, death, love, the brotherhood of man, he kept saying to himself, associating these words with vague yet joyful ideas. The door opened and someone came in. By the dim light, to which Pierre had already become accustomed, he saw a rather short man. Having evidently come from the light into the darkness, the man paused, then moved with cautious steps toward the table and placed on it his small leather-gloved hands. This short man had on a white leather apron which covered his chest and part of his legs. He had on a kind of necklace above which rose a high white ruffle, outlining his rather long face which was lit up from below. "'For what have you come hither?' asked the newcomer, turning in Pierre's direction at a slight rustle made by the latter. "'Why have you, who do not believe in?' the truth of the light and who have not seen the light, come here. What do you seek from us? Wisdom, virtue, enlightenment. Single quote. At the moment the door opened and the stranger came in, Pierre felt a sense of awe and veneration such as he had experienced in his boyhood at confession. He felt himself in the presence of one socially a complete stranger, yet nearer to him through the brotherhood of man. With bated breath and beating heart he moved toward the Rita, by which name the brother who prepared a seeker for entrance into the Brotherhood was known. Dot. Drawing nearer, he recognized in the Rita a man he knew, Smolyaninov, and it mortified him to think that the newcomer was an acquaintance he wished him simply a brother and a virtuous instructor. For a long time he could not utter a word, so that the Rita had to repeat his question. Yes, I, I, desire regeneration, Pierre uttered with difficulty. Very well, said Smolyaninov, and went on at once. Have you any idea of the means by which our holy order will help you to reach your aim? Said he quietly and quickly. I, hope, for guidance, help, in regeneration, said Pierre, with a trembling voice and some difficulty in utterance due to his excitement and to being unaccustomed to speak of abstract matters in Russian. What is your conception of Freemasonry? Single quote. I imagine that Freemasonry is the fraternity and equality of men who have virtuous aims, said Pierre, feeling ashamed of the inadequacy of his words for the solemnity of the moment, as he spoke. I imagine. Dot. Single quote. Good. Said the Rita quickly, apparently satisfied with this answer. Have you sought for means of attaining your aim in religion? Single quote. No, I considered it erroneous and did not follow it, said Pierre, so softly that the Rita did not hear him and asked him what he was saying. I have been an atheist, answered Pierre. You are seeking for truth in order to follow its laws in your life, therefore you seek wisdom and virtue. Is that not so? said the Rita, after a moment's pause. Yes, yes, assented Pierre. The Rita cleared his throat, crossed his gloved hands on his breast, and began to speak. 
Now I must disclose to you the chief aim of our order, he said, and if this aim coincides with yours, you may enter our brotherhood with profit. The first and chief object of our order, the foundation on which it rests and which no human power can destroy, is the preservation and handing on to posterity of a certain important mystery which has come down to us from the remotest ages, even from the first man a mystery on which perhaps the fate of mankind depends. But since this mystery is of such a nature that nobody can know or use it unless he be prepared by long and diligent self-purification, not everyone can hope to attain it quickly. Hence we have a secondary aim. That of preparing our members as much as possible to reform their hearts to purify and enlighten their minds, by means handed on to us by tradition from those who have striven to attain this mystery, and thereby to render them capable of receiving it. By purifying and regenerating our members we try, thirdly, to improve the whole human race, offering it in our members an example of piety and virtue, and thereby try with all our might to combat the evil which sways the world. Think this over and I will come to you again. Single quote. To combat the evil which sways the world, Pierre repeated, and a mental image of his future activity in this direction rose in his mind. He imagined men such as he had himself been a fortnight ago, and he addressed an edifying exhortation to them. He imagined to himself vicious and unfortunate people whom he would assist by word and deed, imagined oppressors whose victims he would rescue. Of the three objects mentioned by the Rita, this last, that of improving mankind, especially appealed to Pierre. The important mystery mentioned by the Rita, though it aroused his curiosity, did not seem to him essential. And the second aim that of purifying and regenerating himself, did not much interest him because at that moment he felt with delight that he was already perfectly cured of his former faults and was ready for all that was good. Half an hour later, the Rita returned to inform the seeker of the seven virtues, corresponding to the seven steps of Solomon's temple, which every Freemason should cultivate in himself. These virtues were. 1 discretion, the keeping of the secrets of the order. 2. Obedience to those of higher ranks in the order. 3. Morality. 4. Love of mankind. 5. Courage. 6. Generosity. 7. The love of death. In the seventh place, try, by the frequent thought of death, the Rita said, to bring yourself to regard it not as a dreaded foe, but as a friend that frees the soul grown weary in the labors of virtue from this distressful life, and leads it to its place of recompense and peace. Single quote. Yes, that must be so, thought Pierre, when after these words the Rita went away, leaving him to solitary meditation. It must be so, but I am still so weak that I love my life, the meaning of which is only now gradually opening before me. But five of the other virtues which Pierre recalled, counting them on his fingers, he felt already in his soul. Courage, generosity, morality, love of mankind, and especially obedience which did not even seem to him a virtue, but a joy. Opening parenthesis. He now felt so glad to be free from his own lawlessness and to submit his will to those who knew the indubitable truth. Closing parenthesis. He forgot what the seventh virtue was and could not recall it. The third time the Rita came back more quickly and asked Pierre whether he was still firm in his intention and determined to submit to all that would be required of him. I am ready for everything, said Pierre. I must also inform you, said the Rita, that our order delivers its teaching not in words only but also by other means, which may perhaps have a stronger effect on the sincere seeker after wisdom and virtue than mere words. This chamber with what you see therein should already have suggested to your heart, if it is sincere, more than words could do. You will perhaps also see in your further initiation a like method of enlightenment. 
our order imitates the ancient societies that explained their teaching by hieroglyphics. A hieroglyph, said the Rita, is an emblem of something not cognizable by the senses but which possesses qualities resembling those of the symbol. Single quote. Pierre knew very well what a hieroglyph was, but dared not speak. He listened to the Rita in silence, feeling from all he said that his ordeal was about to begin. If you are resolved, I must begin your initiation, said the Rita coming closer to Pierre. In token of generosity, I ask you to give me all your valuables. Single quote. But I have nothing here, replied Pierre, supposing that he was asked to give up all he possessed. What you have with you? Watch, money, rings. Pierre quickly took out his purse and watch, but could not manage for some time to get the wedding ring off his fat finger. When that had been done, the Rita said, in token of obedience, I asked you to undress. Single quote. Pierre took off his coat, waistcoat, and left boot according to the Rita's instructions. The mason drew the shirt back from Pierre's left breast, and stooping down pulled up the left leg of his trousers to above the knee. Pierre hurriedly began taking off his right boot also and was going to tuck up the other trouser leg to save this stranger the trouble. But the mason told him that was not necessary and gave him a slipper for his left foot. With a childlike smile of embarrassment, doubt, and self-derision, which appeared on his face against his will, Pierre stood with his arms hanging down and legs apart, before his brother Rita, and awaited his further commands. And now, in token of candor, I ask you to reveal to me your chief passion, said the latter. My passion. I have had so many, replied Pierre. That passion which more than all others caused you to waver on the path of virtue, said the mason. Pierre paused, seeking a reply. Wine. Gluttony. Idleness. Laziness. Irritability. Anger. Women. He went over his vices in his mind, not knowing to which of them to give the preeminence. Women, he said in a low, scarcely audible voice. The mason did not move and for a long time said nothing after this answer. At last he moved up to Pierre and, taking the kerchief that lay on the table, again bound his eyes. For the last time I say to you turn all your attention upon yourself, put a bridle on your senses, and seek blessedness, not in passion but in your own heart. The source of blessedness is not without us but within, Pierre had already long been feeling in himself that refreshing source of blessedness which now flooded his heart with glad emotion.